chapter 30, Grove. The story of Fred and George's flight to freedom was retold so often over the next few days that Harry could tell it would soon become the stuff of Hogwarts legend. I and mean, within a week, <gülüyor> şey vardı, sınav filmindeki kolsuz Necmi miydi? Neydi? Kolsuz bir şey. Ee, bir şey memi, bir şey memi. Ne memiydi o ya? Okan Bayülgen oynadığı karakterden bahsediyor. Ama böyle nasıl efsane olduysa bu da öyle efsane olmuş. Within a week, even those who had been eyewitnesses were half convinced that they had seen the twins dive bomb Ambridge on their brooms, helping her with dung bombs before zooming out of the doors. In the immediate aftermath of their departure, there was a great wave of talk about copying them. So the Terry frequently heard students saying things like, Honestly, some days I just feel like jumping on my broom and leaving this place. Or else, one more lesson like that, and I might just do a Weasley. I mean, <gülüyor> böyle just do a Weasley falan, Weasley yapmak falan, böyle tabirler falan türemeyici. Şaka falan değil. Fred and George had made sure that nobody was likely to forget them very soon. For one thing. They had not left instructions on how to remove the swamp that now filled the corridor on the fifth floor of the east wing. Amrij and Fitch had been observed trying different means of removing it, but without success. Eventually, the area was robbed off and Fitch gnashing his teeth furiously. Gnashing değil, gnashing diyor piyasam geldi. Gnashing diyor diyeceğim. Çevreye bakabilirsiniz siz kendiniz istiyorsanız. Bir şekilde G okumuyor gibi bir his geldi bana şu an. Nashing his teeth furiously was given the task of punting students across it to their classrooms. He was certain that teachers like McGonagall or Flitwick <coughs> could have removed the swamp in an instant. But just as in the case of Fred and George's wildfire with bangs, They seem to prefer to watch Ambridge struggle. Then there were the two large broom-shaped holes in Ambridge's office door, through which Fred and George's clean sweeps had smashed to rejoin the masters. Fitch fitted a new door and removed Harry's fireball to the dungeons where it was removed. Ambridge had set an armed security troll to guard it. However, her troubles were far from over. Inspired by Fred and George's example, a great number of students were now vying for the newly vacant positions of troublemakers in chief. Ama şey olarak, din bağlamında, heri, din bağlamında mı oluyor? Büyü bağlamında oluyor. Büyü bağlamında olduğu için de din bağlamında oluyor. Ama Harry Potter evrene uyması açısından büyü diyeceğim. Büyü bağlamında Fred ile George'un Devamı Harry çünkü haritayı Harry aldı. Hatta Harry, Ron, Hermione der miyiz mesela? Düşün Abdullah. Bunlar Harry'e verdiler. Biraz daha düşün. Ron da kız da özellik. Yani ne diye bana vermiyorlar. Ben onların kardeşiyim falan yaptı. Tamam. Hermione bayağı bir kuralcı falan. Ama bunlar bir şekilde ortalık karıştırmaya devam ediyorlar yani öyle ya da böyle. Harry, Ron, Hermione olabilir. Biraz daha düşün Abdullah. Karar veremiyorum. Yeri geldiğinde tekrar konuşacağız. In spite of the new door, somebody managed to slip a Harry snouted nifler into Amrit's office. Bu şey, para toplayanlar. Which promptly tore the place apart in his search for shiny objects, left on Ambridge on her re entrance and tried to gnaw the rings off her stubby fingers. Dung bombs and stink pellets were dropped so frequently in the corridors that it became the new fashion for students to perform bubblehead charms on themselves before leaving lessons, which ensured them a supply of fresh, clean air. Even though it gave them all the peculiar appearance of wearing upside down goldfish balls on their heads. Fish prowled the corridors with their horse whip ready in his hands. 
let's put the catch Miss Crevens. But the problem was that there were now so many of them that he did not know which way to turn. The inquisitorial squad were inquisitorial, evet. Squad were attempting to help him, but all things kept happening to its members. Worthington of the Slytherin Quidditch team reported to the hospital wing with a horrible skin complaint that made him look as though he had been coated in cornflakes. Pansy Parkinson to Hermione's delight missed all her lessons the following day as she had sprouted antlers. Burada şu da var. Inquisitorial squad'ın karşısına gelecek bir ekibi kurdu gibi bir şey oldu Fred ve George. Hani eğer söz veriyorsanız, işte yemin ediyorsanız amirce kafa tutacağınıza, işte size özel indirim yapacağız ürünlerimiz konusunda falan gibisinden. Şimdi onlar da hedef olarak Inquisitorial Squad'ın üyelerini de alıyorlar falan ve görüyoruz ki gayet dikkat çekecek bir şekilde de Inquisitorial Squad'ın üyeleri böyle yaralanmaya başlıyor diyeyim. Bu durum aslında aşırı iyi yani. Düpedüz böyle bir devrim, vari bir hareket başlatıyor Fred ile George. Bayağı ciddi bir kitleye sahip bir kitle bir şekilde kendini yakalantmadan yaptığı işleri yapabiliyor. Lee Jordan bir kere duruyor okulda. Büyük ihtimal Lee Jordan liderliğinde oluyor zaten. Fiziksel liderliğinde diyeyim. Fred ile George'un liderliğinde ama Lee Jordan onların kankasıydı falan. Düşün Abdullah. Yani, yani, yani şu ana kadar Amic bastırdı, bastırdı, bastırdı, bastırdı. En son Dumbledore'u yolladı. Kendi yerine geçti. Kendi yerine geçesiye Fred ile George artık Dumbledore olmadığı için saygı duyacağınız insan da kalmadı. Onunla girip karşı koydular. Başladılar yani. Onların izinden gelen insanlar karşı koymaya devam ediyor falan. Böyle bir devrimsel bir sürece girdik sonuç olarak. Düşün Abdullah. Neyse buradan daha fazla bir şey çıkmıyor. Yani çıkıyor da şu an aklıma gelmiyor. Ama bir devrim başladı diyebiliyoruz rahat bir şekilde. Güzel. Tamam. Devam. Meanwhile it became clear just how many skyving snake boxes Fred and George had managed to sell before leaving Hogwarts. Amir John had to enter a classroom for the students assembled there to faint, vomit, develop dangerous fevers. Or a spot blood from both nostrils. Shaking with rage and frustration, she attempted to trace the mysterious symptoms to their source. But the students told her stubbornly they were suffering umbrage itis. After putting four successive classes in detention and failing to discover their secret, she was forced to give up and allow the bleeding, swooning, sweating and vomiting students to leave her classes in rows. Bir dakika. Böyle peş peşe dört derse girmiş. Dördünde de insanlar burnum kanıyor şeyi yapmış. Hepsini cezalandırmış. Ama böyle olayı hala keşfedemediği için işte şu nesneyi kullandıkları için böyle oluyor tarzı bir nokta atışı yapamadığı için en son gitmek isteyenlerin gitmesi izin vermiş. Bu bir. ikincisi de şu. Amrich it is ya. Hani böyle e, latince sanki aynen bu latince şeyleri bu hastalık isimleri cetçut falanlar hep latince kelimelerden falan ya hani bir şekilde onlar da böyle düşünüyor ne bileyim İngiltere'deki ana dil işte İngilte, İngiliz İngilizleri mi deniyor işte onlar olsun Amerikan İngilizleri olsun falan hani bunlar da hastalık isimleri işte latince bu kelime falan diyorlar yani latince bildiklerinden değil latince hissini bildikleri için işte bu latince yapıyorlar yani biz aynı şey latince yapıyoruz Almanca yapıyoruz İspanyolca yapıyoruz, La Casa de Paper falan. Şimdi böyle bir tabir yok biliyor musunuz? Dizi ismi de. Siz benim demek istediğimi anladınız. Hani bunlar da aynı hesap. Hissettiklerini anlatıyor bana. Şurada şu Ambridge Itis yapmıyor. Itis ne bileyim. Prioritis falan. Tarzı böyle işte güzel bir örnek veremedim ama bilmiyorum. Hani. Ee, dur, düşün Abdullah düşün düşün düşün. Neyse hani onlar da latinceyi bilmiyorlar ama latincenin hissini biliyorlar. Onun için böyle amic diyorlar, tire bir de bir itis ekliyorlar sonra. Böyle genelde itisle bitiyor latince kelimeler falan. Ondan dolayı böyle itis ekliyorlar falan. Latinceyi bildiklerinden değil, aynen bizim gibi biz Türk'üz onlar, İngiliz falan. Onlar da böyle latinceyi bilmiyor. Onlar da aynı derecede latinceyi uzaklar falan. 
Onlar da böyle şey diyorlar işte eğlence babında latince hissi veren bir iki ek koyup böyle kelimelerin sonuna esprivari şeyler diyorlar işte. Amic, it is amic hastalığı falan. O Türkçe'de bir örnek düşüneyim aklıma geliyor mu? Gelmiyor. Devam ben. But not even the users of the snack boxes could compete with that master of chaos, Pius, who seemed to have taken fast parting words deeply to heart, cackling madly his horse through the school, upending tables, değişik bir kelimeymiş, bursting out of blackboards and toppling statues and vases. Twice he shot Mrs. Norris inside suits of armor from which she was rescued, yowling loudly by the furious caretaker. Çok iyi olmuş bence. He smashed the lanterns and snuffed out candles, juggled burning torches over the heads of screaming students, caused neatly stacked piles of parchment to topple into fires or out of windows, flew to the second floor when he pulled off all the taps in the bathrooms, Drop that bag of tarantulas in the middle of the great hall during breakfast and whenever he fancied a break, spent hours at a time floating along after Amnich and blowing loud raspberries every time she spoke. <laughs> None of the staff but fish seemed to be stirring themselves to help her. Indeed, a week after Fred and George's departure, he witnessed Professor McGonagall walking right past Pierce, who was determinately loosening a crystal chandelier, and could have sworn he heard her tell the poltergeist out of the corner of her mouth, it unscrewed the other way. To cap matters, Montague had still not recovered from his sojourn in the toilet. He remained confused and disorientated. Orion, or even Tater, and his parents were to be observed one Tuesday morning striding up the front drive, looking extremely angry. Should we say something, said Harmony in a worried voice, pressing her cheek against the charm's window so that she could see Mr. and Mrs. Montague marching inside. Ne olacak Ron? Hermione sen kafayı mı yedin? Bu çok güzel bir şey diyecek. Ron diyecek ve bu tarz bir şey diyecek. About what happened to him? In case it helps Madame Pomfrey cure him? Course not, he'll recover, said Ron indifferently. Anyway, more trouble for Ambridge, isn't it? Said Harry in a satisfied voice. He and Ron both tapped the teacups they were supposed to be charming with their wands. Harry spotted four very short legs that would not reach the desk and wriggled pointlessly in mid-air. Ron's grief for very thin spindly legs that hoisted the cup off the desk with great difficulty, trembled for a few seconds, then folded, causing the cup to crack into two. He paused at harmony quickly, mending Ron's cup with a wave of her wand. That's all very well, but what if Montague is permanently injured? Who cares, said Ron irritably, while his teacup stood drunkenly again, trembling violently at the knees. <coughs> Ron'a yapmadıklarını bırakmadı oğlum. Silter'in takımı komple, bizli bizim kralımız, bizli is our kingler falan. Aynen yani, cidden who cares yani. Montague shouldn't have tried to take all those points from Gryffindor, should he? If you want to worry about anyone, Harmony, worry about me. You, she said, catching her teacup as it scampered happily away across the desk on four sturdy little willow patterned legs and replacing it in front of her. Why should I be worried about you? When mom's next letter finally gets through on this screening process, said Ron bitterly, now holding his cup up while its frail legs tried feebly to support its weight, I am going to be in deep trouble. I wouldn't be surprised if she sent a holder again, if she is sent a holder again, but it'll be my fault Fred and George left, you wait, said Ron darkly. She say I should have stopped them leaving, I should have grabbed the ends of their brooms and hung on or something, yeah, it'll be all my fault. 
Well, if she does say that it will be very unfair, you couldn't have done anything. But I'm sure she won't. I mean, if it's really true they've got premises in diagonally now, they must have been planning this for ages. Yeah, but that's another thing. How did they get premises, said Ron, hitting his teacup so hard? Premises that I can lay down because you come over like premises. Ah, böyle diyormuş. Ben de diyorum premises premises öncülü var ya mantıkta. Şu mu premis? O şu. Evet, bak premises deyince öncülüler olmuyor ama bu da ilginç. A house or building together with its land and uh, buildings occupied by a business or considered in an official context. Başka da bir şey dememiş. Çevre taşımaz mülk anlamadılar. Yer araz mülk. Yeah, but that's another thing. How did they get premises, said Ron, hitting his teacup so hard with his wand that its legs collapsed again and it lay twitching before them? It's a bit dodgy, isn't it? They'll need lots of galleons to afford the rent on a place in Diagon Alley. She wants to know what they've been up to to get their hands on that sort of gold. Well, yes, that occurred to me too, said Hermione, allowing her teacup to jog in neat little circles around Hades, whose tubby little legs were still unable to touch the desktop. I've been wondering whether Mundungus has persuaded them, persuaded them to sell stolen goods or something awful. He hasn't, said Harry curtly. How do you know, said Ron and Hermione together, because he hesitated. But the moment to confess finally seemed to have come. There was no good to be gained in keeping silent if it meant anyone suspected that Fred and George were criminals. Ben bunu yedinci kitapta söylüyor zannettiydim. Burada söylüyormuş. Because they got the gold from me. I gave them my tri-wizard winnings last June. There was a shocked silence. The harmonist teacup joked right over the edge of the desk and smashed on the floor. Oh, Hiri, you didn't, she said. Yes, I did, said Hiri, mutinously, and I don't regret it either. I didn't need the gold, and they'll be great at the job shop. But this is excellent, said Ron, looking thrilled. It's all your fault, Hiri. Mom can't blame me at all. Can I tell her? Yeah, I suppose you'd better, said Hiri, duly, especially if she thinks they're receiving stolen cauldrons or something. Hermione said nothing at all for the rest of the lesson. But Harry had a shrewd suspicion that her self-restraint was bound to crack before long. Sure enough, once they had left the castle for break and were standing around in the weak May sunshine, she fixed Harry with a beady eye and opened her mouth with a determined ear. He interrupted her before she had even started. It's no good nagging me, it's done, he said firmly. Fred and George have got the gold. Spent a good bit of it too, by the sounds of it, and I can't get it back from them, and I don't want to. So save your breath, Hermione. I wasn't going to say anything about Fred and George, he said in an injured voice. Ron snorted disbelieving, <laughs> and Hermione threw him a very dirty look. Very dirty look, said Yaptonori. No, I wasn't, she said angrily. As a matter of fact, I was going to ask Harry when he's going to go back to Snape and ask for Occlumency lessons again. Harry's heart sank. Once they had exhausted the subject of Fred and George's dramatic departure, which admittedly had taken many hours, Ron and Hermione had wanted to hear news of Sirius. As Eddie had not confided in them the reason he had wanted to talk to Sirius in the first place, it had been hard to think of things to tell them. He had ended up saying to them truthfully that Sirius wanted Harry to resume Ackerman's lessons. He'd been regretting this ever since. Hermione would not let the subject drop and kept reverting to it when he least expected it. You can't tell me you stopped having funny dreams, Hermione said now, because Ron told me last night you were muttering in your sleep again. He retrieved Ron a furious look. Ron had the grace to look ashamed of himself. You were only muttering a bit, he mumbled apologetically, something about just a bit farther. 
I dreamed I was watching you a lot play. Quidditch is very light, brutally. I was trying to get you to stretch out a bit farther to grab the careful. Ron's ears went red. He felt a kind of vindictive pleasure. He had not, of course, dreamed anything of the sort. Last night, he had once again made a journey along the Department of Mischievous Corridor. <coughs> he had passed through the circular room, then the room full of clicking and dancing light, until he found himself again inside a cavern, cavern used room full of shells on which were rain, ranged dusty glass spheres. Şurada again diyor bu demek ki dusty glass spheres'leri görmüş. Bu dusty glass spheres dediğimiz olay bildiğimiz bizim kehanetler hani. Benim gözümden kaçmış ben bunu şu an ilk defa burada gördüm gibi hissediyorum. Büyük ihtimal bundan önceki bölümdü hiç değilse ondan önceki bölümdü bir dusty glass spheres lafı geçti büyük ihtimal. Ama gözümden kaçmış. He had hurried straight toward row number 97, turned left and ran along it. It had probably been then that he had spoken aloud, just a bit farther. For he could feel his conscious self struggling to wake, and before he had reached the end of the row, he had found himself lying in bed again, gazing up at the canopy of his phone poster. You are trying to block your mind, aren't you, said Harmony, looking beadily at Harry. You are keeping going with your occlumency? Of course I am, said Harry, trying to sound as though this question was insulting, but not quite meeting her eye. The truth was that he was so intensely curious about what was hidden in that room full of dusty orbs that he was quite keen for the dreams to continue. The problem was that with just under a month to go until the exams and every free moment devoted to studying, his mind seemed saturated with information when he went to bed so that he found it very difficult to get to sleep at all. When he did, his overwrought brain presented the most nice with stupid dreams about the exams. He also suspected that part of his mind, the part that often spoke in Harmony's voice, now felt guilty on the occasions it strayed down that corridor ending in the black door, and sought to wake him before he could reach journey's end. You know, said Ron, whose ears were <coughs> still flaming red. <coughs> if Montague doesn't recover before Cedar and play Hufflepuff. You might be in with a chance of winning the cup. Yeah, I suppose so, said Harry, glad of a change of subject. I mean, we won one, lost one. If Cedar and lose, lose the Hufflepuff next Saturday. Yeah, that's right, said Harry, losing track of what he was agreeing to. Cho Chang had just walked across the courtyard, determinedly not looking at him. The final match of the Quidditch season, Gryffindor versus Ravenclaw, was to take place on the last weekend of May. Although Cedric had been narrowly defeated by Hufflepuff in their last match, Gryffindor was not daring to hope for victory, due mainly, though of course nobody said it to him, to Ron's abysmal goalkeeping record. He, however, seemed to have found a new optimism. I mean, I can't get any worse, can I? He told Hiri and Harmony grimly over breakfast on the morning of the match. Nothing to lose now, is there? You know, said Harmony, as she and Hiri walked down to the pitch a little later in the midst of a very excited crowd. I think Rome might do better without Fred and George around. They never exactly gave him a lot of confidence. You know, Lovegood overtook them with what appeared to be a live eagle perched on top of her head. Oh gosh, I forgot, said Harmony, watching the eagle flapping its wings as Luna walked serenely past a group of cackling and pointing slitherins. Cho will be playing, won't she? Hiri, who had not forgotten this, merely granted. They found seats in the topmost row of the stands. It was a fine, clear day. Ron could not wish for it better, and he found himself hoping against hope that Ron would not give the Slytherin's cause for more rousing choruses of Weasley is our king. <coughs> Lee Jordan, 
who had been very dispirited since Fred and George had left, was commentating as usual. As the teams zoomed out onto the pitches, he named the players with something less than his usual. Gusto, Bradley, Davies, Chang, he said, and he felt his stomach perform, less of a backflip, more a feeble lurch as Cho walked out onto the pitch, her shiny black hair rippling in the slight breeze. He was not sure what he wanted to happen anymore, except that he could not stand any more rows. Even the sight of her chatting animatedly to Roger Davies as they prepared to mount their brooms caused him only a slight twinge of jealousy. And they're off, said Lee, and Davies takes the quaffle immediately. Raven Clark, Captain Davies with the quaffle. He dodges Johnson, he dodges Bell, he dodges Spinet as well. He's going straight for God. He's going to shoot and... And Lee swore very loudly, and he scored. He and Harmony groaned with the rest of the Gryffindors. Predictably, horribly, the Slytherins on the other side of the stands began to sing. Weasley cannot save a thing. He cannot block a single ring. He said a hoarse voice in Harry's ear, Harmony. He looked around and saw Hagrid's enormous bearded face sticking between the seats. Apparently, he had squeezed his way all along the row behind. For the first and second years, he had just passed at a ruffled, flattened look about them. For some reason, Hagrid was bent double as though anxious not to be seen, though he was still at least four feet taller than everybody else. Listen, he whispered, can you come with me now while well, everyone's Watching the match. Uh, can't it wait? Hagrid asked Harry till the match is over. No, said Hagrid. No, Harry, it's got to be now. While everyone's looking the other way, please. Hagrid's nose was gently dripping blood. His eyes were both blackened. He had not seen him this close up since his return to the school. He looked utterly woe begone. Course, said Harry at once. Course will come. He and Hermione aged back along their row of seats, causing much grumbling among the students who had to stand up for them. The people in Hagrid's row were not complaining, merely attempting to make themselves as small as possible. I, pre I appreciate this, you too, I really do, said Hagrid as they reached the stairs. He kept looking around nervously as they descended toward the lawn below. I just... Hope she doesn't notice us. Go in. You mean... <coughs> you mean Amrich, said Hedy. She won. She's got her holding key. Zitorio squad sitting with her. Didn't you see? She must be expecting trouble at the match. Yeah, well, a bit of trouble with the nerd, said Hagrid, pausing to peer around the edge of the stands to make sure the stretch of lawn between that and his cabin was deserted. Give us more time. What is it, Hagrid, said Hermione, looking up at him with a concerned expression on her face as they hurried across the long, towered edge of the forest. You, you see, Emma, said Hagrid, looking over his shoulder as a great roar rose from the stands behind them. Hey, did someone just call? It'll be Ravenclaw, said Harry, heavily. Good, good, said Hagrid, distractedly. That's good. They had, to jog, they had to jog to keep up with him as he strode across the lawn, looking around with every other step. When they reached his cabin, Harmony turned automatically left toward the front door. Hagrid, however, walked straight past it into the shade of the trees on the othermost edge of the forest, where he picked up a crossbow that was leaning against a tree. When he realized they were no longer with him, he turned. We're going in here, he said, jerking his shaggy head behind them. Into the forest, said Harmony, perplexed. Yeah, said Hagrid. Come on now, quick, before we're spotted. He and Harmony looked at each other. Then ducked into the cover of the trees behind Hagrid, who was already striding away from them <clears throat> into the green gloom, his crossbow over his arm. He and Harmony ran to catch up with him. Hagrid, why are you armed, said Harry. Just a precaution, said Hagrid, shrugging his massive shoulders. 
you didn't bring your crossbow the day you showed us the test real set harmony timidly. Uh, well, we weren't going in so far. Then I said, Hagri. And anyway, that was before friends left the forest, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Why does friends leaving make a difference? As Harmony curiously, because the other centaurs are good and riled at me. That's why I said Hagrid quietly, glancing around. They used to be, well, you couldn't call them friendly, but we got on all right, kept themselves to themselves, but always turned up if I wanted a word. Not anymore. He sighed deeply. Friends said that they're angry because he went to work for Dumbledore. <coughs> Friends said that they're angry because he went to work for Dumbledore, he asked, tripping on a protruding route because he was busy watching Hagrid's profile. He yes, said Hagrid heavily, well, angry doesn't cover it, rather leave it. If I hadn't stepped in, I reckon they'd have kicked friends to death. They attacked him, said Hermione, sounding shocked. Yep, said Hagrid, gruffly, forcing his way through several low-hanging branches. He had half the herd onto him. And you stopped it, said Harry, amazed and impressed. By yourself? Of course I did. Couldn't stand by and watch him kill him, could I, said Hagrid. Like I was passing, really, and I'd have thought friends might have remembered that before he started sending me stupid warnings, he added hotly and unexpectedly. He and I when he looked at each other, startled, but Hagrid, scowling, did not elaborate. Anyway, he said, breathing a little more heavily than usual, since then the other centaurs have been livid with me and the trouble is they got a lot of influence in the forest cleverest creatures in here. Is that why we're here? Hagrid asked Harmony. The centaurs? Oh no, said Hagrid, shaking his head dismissively. No, it's not them. Well, of course, they could complicate the problem, yeah. But do you see what I mean in a bit? On this incomprehensible note, he fell silent and forged a little ahead, taking one stride for every three of theirs so that they had great trouble keeping up with him. The path was becoming increasingly overgrown, and the trees grew so closer together as they walked farther, farther and farther into the forest that it was as dark as dusk. They were soon a long way past the clearing where Hagrid had shown them the test rules, but he felt no sense of unease until Hagrid stepped unexpectedly off the path and began wending his way in and out of trees toward the dark heart of the forest. Hagrid said Harry, fighting his way through thickly knotted brambles over which <clears throat> Hagrid had stepped easily and remembering very vividly what had happened to him on the other occasions he had stepped off the forest path. Where are we going? <clears throat> With further said Hagrid over his shoulder, come on Harry, we need to keep together now. It was a great struggle to keep up with Hagrid, but with branches and thickets of thorn through which Hagrid marched as easily as though they were cobwebs. But which snagged Hiri and Harmony's ropes, frequently entangling them so swearily that they had to stop for minutes at a time <clears throat> to free themselves. His arms and legs were soon covered in small cuts and scratches. They were so deep in the forest now that sometimes all they could see of Hagrid in the gloom was a messy dark shape ahead of him. Any sound seemed threatening in the muffled silence. The breaking of a twig echoed loudly and the tiniest rustle of movement, though it might have been made by an innocent sparrow, caused Hiri to peer through the gloom for a culprit. It occurred to him that he had never managed to get this far into the forest without meeting some kind of creature. Their absence struck him as rather ominous. Hagrid, will it be all right if we lit our bones at Harmony quietly? Eh, all right, Hagrid whispered back. In fact, he stopped suddenly and turned around. Harmony walked right into him and was knocked over backwards. He caught her just before she hit the forest floor. 
maybe we best just talk for a moment so I can feel you in Sadhaguri before we get there. Like, Guru Siddhar Muni is able to set her back on her feet. They both murmured rumors and their warm tips ignited. Hagrid's face warmed through the gloom by the light of the two wavering beams, and it saw that he looked nervous and said again, Right, said Hagrid. Well, see, the thing is, he took a great breath. Well, there is a good chance I am going to be getting the sack any day now, he said. Terry and Hermione looked at each other, then back at him. But you lasted this long, I'm mean, said tentatively. What makes you think I'm just reckons it was me that put the Niffler in her office? And was it, said Harry, before he could stop himself? No, it really well wasn't, said Hagrid indignantly. Only anything to do with magical creatures, and she thinks it's got something to do with me. You know, she's been looking for a chance to get rid of me ever since I got back. I don't want to go. Of course, but if it wasn't for, well, the special circumstances I am about to explain to you, I'd leave right now before she's got the, got the chance, got dejected, got the chance to do it in front of the whole school like she did, like she did with Triloni. Harry and Hermione both made noises of protest, but Hagrid overrode them with a wave of one of his enormous hands. It's not the end of the world. I'll be able to help Dumbledore once I'm out of here. I can be useful to the Order. I knew Lodo have grabbed the plan. You'll, you'll get through your exams fine. His voice trembled and broke. Don't worry about me, he said hastily as Hermione made to pat his arm. He pulled his enormous spotted handkerchief from the pocket of his waistcoat and mopped his eyes with it. Look. I wouldn't be telling you this at all if I didn't have to. See, if I go, well, I can't live without, without telling someone because I I need you two to help me and Ron if he's willing. Of course, we'll help you, said Harry at once. What do you want us to do? Hagrid gave a great sniff and patted Harry wordlessly on the shoulder with such force that Harry was knocked sideways into a tree. I knew it. Say yes, said Hagrid into his handkerchief, but I won't never forget. Well, come on, just a little bit further through here. Watch yourselves now, there is nettles. They walked on in silence for another 15 minutes. Harry had opened his mouth to ask how much farther they had to go when Hagrid threw out his right arm to signal that they should stop. Really easy, he said softly, very quiet now. They crept forward and he saw that they were facing a large, smooth mound of earth nearly as tall as Hagrid, that he thought, with a jaw of dread, was sure to be the lair of some enormous animal. Trees had been ripped up at the roots all around the mound, so that it stood on a bare patch of ground, surrounded by heaps of trunks and boughs that formed a kind of fence or barricade, behind which Harry, Hermione, and Hagrid now stood. Sleep in, breathed Hagrid. Sure enough, Harry could hear a distant, rhythmic rumbling that sounded like a pair of enormous lungs at work. He glanced sideways at Hermione, who was gazing at the man with her mouth slightly open. She looked utterly terrified. Hagrid, she said in a whisper, barely audible over the sound of the sleeping creature. Who is he? He found this an odd question. What is it? Was the one he had been planning on asking. Hagrid, you told us, said Hermione, her wand now shaking in her hand. You told us none of them wanted to come. He looked from her to Hagrid and then, as realization hit him, he looked back at the mound with a small gasp of horror. The great mound of earth on which he, Hermione and Hagrid could easily have stood was moving slowly up and down in time with the deep, grunting reading. It was not a man at all. It was a curved bag of what was clearly, well, no, he didn't want to come, said Hagrid, sounding desperate, but I had, but I had to bring him, Hermione. I had to. But why, asked Hermione, who sounded as though she wanted to cry. Why? What? Oh, Hagrid. I knew if I just got... 
him back, said Hagrid, sounding close to tears himself, and, and taught him a few manners. I'd be able to take him outside and show everyone he's, everyone he's harmless. Harmless, said Hermione shrilly, and Hagrid made frantic, pushing noises with his hands as the enormous creature before them grunted loudly and shifted in its sleep. He's been hurting you all this time, hasn't he? That's why you had all these injuries. You don't know his own strength, said Hagrid earnestly, and he's getting better. He's not fighting so much anymore. So this is why it took you two months to get home, said Hermione distractedly. Oh, Hagrid, why didn't you bring him back if he didn't want to come? Wouldn't he have been happier with his own people? They were all bullying him, Hermione, because he is so small, said Hagrid. Small, said Hermione. Small? Hermione, I couldn't leave him, said Hagrid. Tears now trickling down his blue wise face into his beard. See, he's my brother. Hermione simply stared at him, her mouth open. Hagrid, when you say brother, said Harry slowly, do you mean, well, half brother, amended Hagrid? Turns out my mother took up with another giant when she left me dead, and she went and had grub here. Grub, said Harry. Yeah, well, that's what it sounds like when he says his name, said Hagrid anxiously. He don't speak a lot of English. I've been trying to teach him. Anyway, she don't seem to have liked him much more she liked me. Anyway, she don't seem to have liked him much more than she liked me. See with giant tisses, what counts is producing good big kids. And he's always been a bit on the ranty side for a giant, only 16 foot. Oh yes, tiny said Harmony with a kind of hysterical sarcasm. Absolutely minuscule. He was being kicked around by all of all of them. I just couldn't leave him. Did Madame Maxim want to bring him back? asked Harry. She well, she could see it was right important to me, said Hagri, twisting his enormous hands. But but she's got a bit tired of him after a while, I must admit. So we split up on the journey home. She promised not to tell anyone, though. How on earth did you get them back without anyone noticing, said Harry. Well, that's why it took so long. See, said Hagrid, could only travel by night and through wild country and stuff. Of course, he covers the Grand Prix de Val when he wants to, but he kept wanting to go back. No, oh, Hagrid, why on earth didn't you let him, said Hermione, flopping down onto a ripped up tree and burying her face in her hands. What do you think you're going to do with a violent giant who doesn't even want to be here? Well, now, violent, that's a bit harsh, said Hagrid, still twisting his hands agitated, agitatedly, agitatedly. Agitatedly, Tom. I admit he might have taken a couple of swings at me when he's been in a bad mood, but he's getting better, lots better, settling down well. What are those ropes for, then he asked. He had just noticed Rob's tigger sapling stretching from around the trunks of the largest nearby trees toward the place where Grave Grove lay curled on the ground with his back to them. You have to keep him tied up, said Hermione faintly. Well, yes, said Hagrid, looking anxious. See, it's like I say, he doesn't really know his strength. He understood now why that had been such a suspicious leg of any other living creature in this part of the forest. So what is it you want Hiri and Ron and me to do, Hermione asked apprehensively. Look after him, said Hagrid, crockily, after I'm gone. Hiri and Hermione exchanged miserable looks. <clears throat> Hiri uncomfortably aware that he had already promised Hagrid that he would do whatever he asked. But what does it involve exactly, Hermione he inquired. Not food or anything, said Hagrid eagerly. He can get his own food, no problem. Birds and deer and stuff. No, it's company he needs. If I just knew someone was carrying on trying to help him a bit, teaching him, you know. He said nothing, but turned to look back at the gigantic form lying asleep on the ground in front of them. Grabwa had his back to them. Unlike Hagrid, who simply looked like a very oversized human. Grub looked strangely misshapen. What he had taken to be a vast, 
mostly boulder to the left of the great earth mound he now recognized as Europe's head. It was much larger in proportion to the body than a human head, almost perfectly round and covered with tightly curling, close growing hair the color of bracken. The rim of a single large flesh ear was visible on top of the head, which seemed to sit rather like Uncle Vernon's directly upon the shoulders with little or no neck in between. The bag, under what looked like a dirty brownish smoke comprised of animal skins sewn roughly together, was very broad. And as Grob slept, it seemed to strain a little at the rough seams of the skins. The legs were curled up under the body, and he could see the soles of enormous, filthy bare feet largest ledges resting one on top of the other on the earthy forest floor. He wanted us to teach him, he said in a hollow voice. He now understood what Francis' warning had meant. His attempt is not working. He would do better to abandon it. Of course, the other creatures who lived in the forest would have heard Hagrid's fruitless attempts to teach Grunov English. Yeah, even if you just talk to him a bit, said Hagrid, hopefully, because I reckon if you can talk to people, he'll understand more that we all like him really and want him to stay. He looked at Hermione, who peered back at him from between the fingers of her face. Kind of makes you wish we had Norbert back, doesn't it? He said, and she gave a very shaky laugh. He'll do it then, said Hagrid, who did not seem to have called what Harry had just said. But we'll, said Harry, already bound by his promise. We'll try, Hagrid. I knew I could count on you, Harry, Hagrid said, beaming in a very watery way and dabbing at his face with his handkerchief again. And I don't want you to put yourself out too much. Like, I know you got exams. If you could just nip down here in your invisibility clock maybe once a week and have a little chat with him, I wake him up, then introduce you. Well, no. Bir dakika, I have a little chat with him, dedi sonra üç nokta bir anına durdu. Sonra da I wake him up, then introduce you. Onu uyandıracağım şimdi falan yaptı. Well, no, said Hermione, jumping up. Hagrid, no, don't wake him, really, we don't need. But Hagrid had already stepped over the great trunk in front of them and was proceeding toward Grob. When he was around 10 feet away, he lifted a long, broken ball from the ground, smiled reassuringly over his shoulder at Harry and Hermione, and then poked Grob hard in the middle of the bag with the end of the ball. The giant gave a roar that echoed around the silent forest. Birds in the treetops overhead rose, twittering from their perches and soared away. In front of Hiri and Harmony, meanwhile, the gigantic grove was rising from the ground. We shuddered as he placed an enormous hand upon it to push himself onto his knees and turned his head to see who and what had disturbed him. All right, we're all peace at Hagrid in a would be cheery voice, making a wave at the long buff raised, ready to pork grow again. Had a nice sleep, eh? Hiri and Hermione retreated as far as they could while still keeping the giant within their sights. Grob knelt between two trees he had not yet uprooted. They looked up into his startlingly huge face, which resembled a grey full moon swimming in the gloom of the clearing. It was as though the futures had been hanged onto a great stone ball. The nose was stubby and shapeless, the mouth lopsided and full of misshapen yellow teeth the size of half bricks. The small eyes were a muddy greenish brown and just now were half gummed together with sleep. Rob raised dirty knuckles as big as cricket balls to his eyes, rubbed vigorously then without warning pushed himself to his feet with surprising speed and agility. Oh my, he heard Hermione squeal, terrified beside them. The trees to which the other ends of the ropes around grubs, wrists and ankles were attached creaked ominously. 
he was, as Hargit had said, at least 16 feet tall. Gazing blearily around, he reached out a hand the size of a beach, beach umbrella, seized a bird's nest from the upper branches of a towering pine, and turned it upside down with a roar of apparent displeasure that there was no bird in it. Eggs fell like grenades over the ground, and Hagrid threw his arms over his head to protect himself. Anyway, Gralpi shot at Hagrid, looking up apprehensively in case of further falling eggs. I brought some friends to meet you. Remember, I told you I might. Remember when I said I might have to go on a little trip and leave them to look after you for a bit? Remember that, Gropi? But Grob merely gave another low roar. It was hard to say whether he was listening to Hagrid or whether he even recognized the sounds Hagrid was making a speech. He had now seized the top of the pine tree and was pulling it toward them, evidently for the simple pleasure of seeing how what it would spring back when he let go. Now, Grumpy, don't do that, you to Hagrid. That's how he ended up pulling up the others, and sure enough, he could see the earth around the tree's roots beginning to crack. I got company for you, Hagrid shouted. Company, see, look down, you big buffoon. I brought you some friends. Oh, Hagrid don't want harmony. But Hagrid had already raised the buff again and gave Grove's knee a sharp poke. The giant let go of the top of the pine tree, which swayed menacingly and deluged Hagrid with a rain of needles and looked down. This, said Hagrid, hastening over to where Harry and Emily stood, is Harry Grove, Harry Potter. He might be coming to visit you if I have to go away, understand? The giant had only just realized that Harry and Emily were there. They watched in great trepidation as he lowered his huge boulder of a, of a head so that he could peer blearily at them. And this is Hermione, see? Her Hagrid hesitated, turning to Hermione, he said, Would you mind if he called you Hermione? Hermione? Only it's a difficult name for him to remember. No, not at all, squeaked Hermione. This is Hermie, Grab, and she's gonna be coming and all. Isn't it nice? Eh, two friends for you there, for you to crop it, no. Grob's hand had shot out of nowhere toward her money. He seized her and pulled her backwards behind the tree so that Grob's fist scraped the trunk but closed on thin air. Bend the boy, Grob, he heard her targeted yelling as Emily clung to Harry behind the tree, shaking and whimpering. Very bad boy, you don't grab, ouch. And he poked his head out from around the trunk and saw Hagrid lying on his back, his hand over his nose. Grob, apparently losing interest, had straightened up again and was again engaged in pulling back the pine as far as it, as far as it would go. Rai said Hagrid thickly, getting up with one hand, pinching his bleeding nose and the other grasping his crossbow. Well, there you are. You met him and, and now he'll know you when you come back. Yeah, well. He looked up at Grob, who was now pulling back the pine with an expression of detached pleasure on his boldish face. The roots were creaking as he ripped them away from the ground. Well, I reckon that's enough for one day, said Hagrid. We'll, uh, we'll go back now, shall we? Hilly and Hermione nodded. Hagrid shouldered his crossbow again and, still pinching his nose, led the way back into the trees. Nobody spoke for a while, not even when they heard the distant crash that meant Grub had pulled over the pine tree at last. Hermione's face was pale and sad. He could not think of a single thing to say. What on earth was going to happen when somebody found out that Hagrid had hidden Grob in the forest and he had promised that he, Ron, and Hermione would continue Hagrid's totally pointless attempts to civilize the giant? How could Hagrid, even with his immense capacity to delude himself that fanged monsters were lovably harmless,
of course how great even with his immense capacity to delude himself that fang the monsters were lovably harmless fool himself that grove would ever to ever be fit to mix with humans holy said hagrid abruptly just as he and harmony were struggling through a patch of thick knot grass behind them he pulled an arrow out of the quiver over his shoulder and fitted it into the crossbow. Her and Hermione raised their wands. Now that they had stopped walking, they too could hear movement close by. Oh, blind, said Hagrid quietly. I thought that we told you, Hagrid, said a deep male voice, that you are no longer welcome here. A man's naked torso seemed for an instant to be floating toward them, through the dappled green hull flight. Then they saw that his waist joined smoothly with a horse's chestnut body. The centaur had a proud, high cheekboned face and long black hair. Like Hagrid, he was armed. A quiver full of arrows and a long bow were slung over his shoulders. How are you, my girl, Riven? said Hagrid bitterly. The trees behind the centaur rustled and four or five more emerged behind them. He recognized the black-bodied and bearded Bane, whom he had met nearly four years ago on the same night he had met friends. Bane gave no sign that he had ever seen any before. So he said with a nasty inflection in his voice before turning immediately to Magorivan, we agreed, I think, what we will do if this human showed his face in the forest again? This human now am I, said Hagrid testily, just who's stopping all of you committing murder? You ought not to have meddled, Hagrid, said Magor even, or ways are not yours, nor are our laws. Friends had betrayed and dishonored us. I don't know how you worked it out, said Hagrid impatiently. He's done nothing except help Albus Dumbledore. Trans has entered into servitude to humans, said a grey centaur with a hard, deeply lined face. Servitude, said Hagrid scathingly. He's doing Dumbledore a favor is all. He's peddling our knowledge and secrets among humans, said Magorivan quietly. There can be no return from such a disgrace. If you say so, said Hagrid, shrugging. But personally, I think you're making a big mistake, making a big mistake. As are you, human, said Bane, coming back into our, into our forest when you warned you, when we warned you. Now you listen to me, said Hagrid angrily. I'll have less of the our forest if it's all the same to you. It is not up to you who comes and goes in here. No more is it up to you, Hagrid, said Magorion smoothly. I shall let you pass today because you are accompanied by your young. They're not his, interrupted Bane contemptuously. Students, my Gorion, from up at the school, they have probably already profited from the traitor Francis' teachings. Nevertheless, said my Gorion calmly, the slaughter of foibles is a terrible crime. We do not touch the innocent. Today, Hagrid, you pass. Henceforth, stay away from this place. You forfeited the friendship of the centaurs when you helped the traitor friends escape us. I won't be kept out of the out of the forest by a bunch of mules like you said Hagrid loudly. By a böyle kafa tutuyor. Baya tehlikeli bir şekilde mules dedi. Hakaret etti yani. Kaç tane? Beş tane, altı tane vardı orada. Hakaret etti. Korkmuyor. Sinmiyor Hagrid. Hani korkaklık olarak görüyor. Yapmıyor onun için falan. Hagrid said Hermione in a high-pitched and terrified voice as both Bane and the Grey Centaur paved at the ground. Let's go, please, let's go. Hagrid moved forward, but his crossbow was still raised and his eyes were still fixed, threatening, threatening upon Magorivan. We know that you are keeping in the forest. We know what you are keeping in the forest, Hagrid. Magorivan called after them as the centaur slipped out of sight. And our tolerance is waning. Hagrid turned and gave every appearance of wanting to walk straight back to Magorion again. You tolerate him as long as he is here. It is as much his forest as yours, he yelled, while Harry and Hermione both pushed with all their might against Hagrid's 
most keen way is called in an effort to keep him moving forward, still scowling, he looked down. His expression changed to mild surprise at the sight of them both pushing him. He seemed not to have felt it. Calm down, you two, he said, turning to walk on while they panted along behind him. Are the old next door, eh? Hagi said Hermione breathlessly, skirting the patch of nettles they had passed on their way there. If the centaur don't want humans in the forest, it doesn't really look as though Harry and I will be able. Ah, you heard what they said, said Hagi dismissively. They wouldn't hurt fowls. I mean kids. Anyway, let me look at Nasıl okunuyormuş onu da merak ettim. Spa. <gülüyor> Thai spa. Fall. Fall. They wouldn't hurt falls. I mean kids. Anyway, we can't let ourselves be pushed around by that lot. Nice try, Harry murmured to Hermione, who looked crestfallen. At last they rejoined the path and after another ten minutes, the trees began to tint. They were able to see patches of clear blue sky again and hear, in the distance, the definite sounds of cheating and shooting. Was it another goal? asked Hagrid, pausing in the shelter of the trees as the Quidditch Stadium came into view. Or do you reckon the match is over? I don't know, said Hermione miserably. It is so that she looked much the worse for Veer. Her hair was full of bits of twig and leaves. Her robes were ripped in several places, and there were numerous scratches on her face and arms. He knew he could look little better. I reckon it's over, you know, said Hagrid, still squinting toward the stadium. Look, there is people coming out already, which if you two hurry, you'll be able to blend in with the crowd and no one will know you were in there. Good idea, said Hagrid. Well, see you later then, Hagrid. I don't believe him, said Hermione in a very unsteady voice. The moment they were out of earshot of Hagrid, I don't believe him. I really don't believe him. Calm down, said Harry. Calm down, she said feverishly. A giant, a giant in the forest. And you're supposed to give him English lessons. Always assuming, of course, we can get past the herd of murderous centaurs on the way in and out. I don't believe him. İngilizce ders istiyor. Gerçek İngilizceyi açacak Hagrid böyle bir laptop koyacak da şeyin önüne. Basacak şöyle düğmesine. Grabi bazen dinleyecek, bazen dinlemeyecek falan. Tertemiz. Kaç bak kaç saatlik materyal var. 240 saat, 240 tane video olsa rahat 120 saatin üstünde materyal var şu an. Gerçek İngilizce diyoruz, Hagrid diyoruz. We haven't got to do anything yet, Harry tried to reassure her in a quiet voice. Tried to reassure her in a quiet voice as they joined a stream of jabbering Hufflepuffs heading back toward the castle. He's not asking us to do anything unless he gets chucked out and that might not even happen. Oh, come off, come off it, Harry said Herman angrily, stopping dead in her tracks so that the people behind her had to swerve to avoid her. Of course, he's going to be chucked out and to be perfectly honest, after what we've just seen, who can blame Umbridge? There was a pause in which Harry glared at her, and her eyes filled slowly with tears. You didn't mean that, said Harry quietly. No, well, right, I didn't, she said, wiping her eyes angrily. But why does he have to make life so difficult for himself, for us? I don't know. Weasley is our king. Weasley is our king. He didn't let the careful in. Weasley is our king. And I wish they'd stop singing that stupid song, said Hermione miserably. Haven't they gloated enough? A great tide of students was moving up the sloping lawns from the pitch. Or let's get in before we have to meet the Slytherin, said Hermione. Weasley can't save anything. He never leaves a single ring. That's why Gryffindors all say Weasley is our king. Hermione said it slowly. The song was growing louder, but it was issuing not from a crowd of green and silver clad Slytherins, but from a mess of red and gold moving slowly toward the castle, which was beating a solitary figure upon its main shoulders. Weasley is our king. Weasley is our king. He didn't let the careful in. Weasley is our king. 
Nose harmony in a harsh voice. Yes, said Hedy loudly. Hedy, harmony, yelled Rod, waving the silver Quidditch cup in the air and looking quite beside himself. We did it. We won. They beamed up at him as he passed. There was a scrum at the door of the castle. Scrum at the door of the castle and Ron's head got rather badly bumped on the lint head, but nobody seemed to want to put him down. Still singing, the crowd squeezed itself into the entrance hall and out of sight. Harry and Hermione watched them go beaming until the last echoing strains of "This is our king" died away. Then they turned to each other, their smiles fading. We save our news till tomorrow, shall we? Said Harry. Yes, all right. Said Hermione wearily. I'm not in any hurry. They climbed the steps together. At the front doors, both instinctively looked back at the Forbidden Forest. He was not sure whether it was his imagination or not, but he rather thought he saw a small cloud of birds erupting into the air over the treetops in the distance. Almost as though the tree in which they had been nesting had just been pulled up by the roots. Chapter 31 Durus Şey Ols Ron niye yoktu sadece Harry ile Hermione var acaba? Şu da Ron'dur belki falan. Diyecek son laflar düşün Abdullah. Bir şey yok. Hadi görüşürüz.